So the title is Conservative Causality. And you might never have heard this term. Actually, um, that's why I will just right from the start jump in and tell you what I mean with conservative causality. And later on, I will clarify some concepts, namely what I mean by causal order or causality. And I will give you some examples of theories of conservative causality and discuss their properties. So under the term conservative causality, I understand the comprehensive framework. So this means it's a, it's a family of theories. And the idea is to generalize an existing theory like quantum theory such that the local description, this means the in operational sense, like if you have Alice, the local description of Alice is conserved. It remains quantum theory, if we talk about the quantum version of uh, conservative causality. And it will turn out that these theories are rather tame. So they uh, keep the, the features of the original theory, like quantum theory as an example, but the notion of causality will be relaxed. And so this is how, how this is done. Um, just a, a short recipe. So the first such theory was developed by Ognjan Oreshkov here on the top, uh, together with Fabio Costa and Charles Bruckner. It's called the process matrix framework. And later on, we de developed with Stefan Wolf together the, this conservative causality theory for probability theory or discrete functions. And the recipe is as follows. You take some theory T, for instance, quantum theory, and then you assume that locally, no party observes any deviation from that theory. And from that, you derive the global dynamics for that new theory. Okay. So there is some hand wavy similarity if one constructs such a con theory of conservative causality. There's some similarity to special and general relativity. Namely, the, um, the, conservative, the conservative causality theory T so if you use T as the building, the basic theory, relates kind of in the same way to the original theory T as general relativity relates to special relativity. And this is the case because also in general relativity, if you look at free falling observers in sufficiently small space time regions, their surrounding will be described only by special relativity. And the same is here. We have a global theory, some conservative causality theory T, and the local description is always T, is the, 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 the core theory that we take. And so here I will, I will give you some motivations why one should consider such theories at all. Well, one thing is that in, in conservative causality, we can ask the question precisely, what is the origin of causal order? I will come to that a bit later. And um, what are the consequences of violating causal order? And how can we combine operational theories with general relativity? I will just now go one by one through these questions just to, to motivate uh, this talk. So what is the origin of causal order? So if, if you develop a theory of conservative causality, I already have claimed that this theory will have a relaxed notion of causality. So causal order that I will describe more in detail after, um, is not preserved. Then we can ask what assumption do we need to add to this theory such that we retrieve again a theory with a well defined causal order, a theory that we are used to. And this is very, um, very similar to also Wheeler's puzzle, who, who asked uh, how to derive time without presupposing time. So this was a, a, a task that Wheeler posed in 1988. And the motivation for his for this question was, of course, the, the Wheeler and David equation, which shows that if you have a, um, a wave function for the whole universe, its time derivative is zero. It does not evolve in time. So if you have a theory with such a feature, how can we still go back to time and to clocks? We nevertheless have time and observe time. And another point why this question might be of interest is, is uh, from general relativity's perspective, namely the closed time-like curves. So closed time-like curves, I will describe them later on as well. They are word lines of particles in a space-time geometry of general relativity such that the particle would bump into itself. And this is consistent with general relativity. But of course, we think that these solutions, these closed time-like curves are just mathematical artifacts. 
So how can we make this point precise to show that these are mathematical artifacts? Well, one way is to show an assumption, which is reasonable, the principle from which causality is retrieved, from which we can rule out such close semi curves in general relativity. So this is one, one motivation I see for, for developing such theories and study, studying their properties. Another one is to study the consequences of violating causal order. So this kind of, by this we go kind of beyond the standard notion of causality that we know and ask what, how does the world look, uh, looks outside? And this will answer the question kind of what does causality or how does causal order restrict the way we process information or we do computation? And also by doing this step from going from a standard theory like quantum theory to a more general theory, we can derive new bounds to kind of upper bound the power of information processing. And these bounds will generally then also hold for quantum theory itself. So this is a standard technique by going outside from a theory to study it to, and to say something about the theory itself. And then one can go on with this kind of um, ideas and, and ask, well, what, what is the role of causality in, for instance, Bell non-local correlations? There has been much uh, literature since the 70s, I would say, on this topic, and um, well, which, which hasn't been resolved yet. And finally, a third motivation is to combine operational theories with general relativity. So general relativity is, of course, a theory that is very accurate for all purposes that we, we use, but it's not operational in the, in, the, in the sense that we use quantum information where we have Bell non locality and so on. We, have, we think of parties or cryptography. We think of parties, Alice, Bob, Charlie doing operations and exchanging systems. General relativity is not phrased at all like this. And it's a big question how to make general relativity operational. And this is also one way that goes towards this, this direction because consider, conservative causality gives us toy theories. So if you assume T that in, in this recipe I showed you before, if you assume T to be quantum theory, then this, um, conservative, this theory of conservative causality will be an operational theory. We will have Alice and Bob and Charlie, but they will be kind of in a setup that is similar to general relativity for the same reasoning with, uh, that I explained to you before, because conservative causality relates to the original theory similarly as um, general relativity relates to special relativity. So this also helps us, of course, to kind of predict dynamics in quantum gravity. There's many the there are many theories of quantum gravity, but we, we don't know which one to select, but this kind of is a, is a more operational approach to this, this task. And moreover, these theories turn out to be much simpler than general relativity or quantum gravity because there's less physical content. So we don't have to consider fields or uh, electrodynamics and so on. And on the other hand, it's also more general because we can assume T to be anything. We don't have to restrict it to quantum theory or whatever. So I hope I have convinced you and not lost you already in this introduction, in this very short introduction of, on what I mean with conservative causality. So it really is, okay, take a theory, conserve it on the local description, and then study the global dynamics. And what we will see that the notion of causality will be altered and the rest will remain almost the same. Good. So now let me, let's make it a bit more precise. And for that purpose, I will first discuss causal order, what I mean with causal order. And this is kind of the notion of causality. I will give a short intermezzo on closed time-like curves, which will be relevant. And then I will give two examples of theories of conservative causality. One is the process matrix framework. So this is kind of the quantum version and then the classical deterministic version. And I will show how it violates the notion of causal order. And I will conclude then with the state of art. So with, with all properties that we know about these uh, theories and with uh, the main open questions that, that remain. So, but before I go on, I cannot see whether anyone has written any questions. Are there any questions? No, no, none so far. Oh, oh okay, good. Good, causal order. So what, what is causal order? Well, 
in the physics literature, but what is, what is meant by causal order is that no event is influenced by its future. And this is kind of the left side of this slide. So we have a space-time diagram. We have time going from bottom to top and space on the horizontal axis. And we have two events. So these are space-time points, Alice A and B, excuse me. And the dashed lines represent the light cones. So a signal from A can reach any point within this future light cone of A. Now causal order means that no event is influenced by its future. So this means that A is not influenced by B. And in the space side diagram, this reads as there is no word line. So no trajectory from B where along the trajectory, a particle would never exceed the speed of light that goes from B to A. This is the notion of causal order in, in, uh, in kind of relativity. In causal modeling, kind of more as a computer science perspective, this notion of causal order is very similar. So uh, there we, people talk about causal structures. So we have random variables. Here on the right side, we have the example of four random variables, A, B, C, D. And the causal structure is just a graph that connects these variables with edges. So we have an edge from A to B, and an edge from B to C, as well as from A to C, and one from C to D. And these denote the causal relationships. So B is influenced by A, which is given by the model parameters. So we have the probability of B given A, conditional probability, and C depends on A and B, and D depends on C. And A does not depend on anything. So now in this notion of causal structure, which is used in causal modeling, the causal order is reflected by requiring that the graph that describes the structure is directic acyclic. So there's no cycle, directed cycle from one node to itself. This is what is meant in, uh, in causal modeling literature with causal order. Now, these two notions of causal order are surely fine and, and very uh, reasonable and sensible. But kind of what we lack here is this operational approach that I was talking about before. Like in, in the usual bell setup and so on, we talk about parties doing operations and how these parties relate. So, and we will see that this helps actually to clarify the notion of causal order even further. And this will then be the notion of causal order that they will use. But before I would just briefly say what I mean with a party. A party is just a localized space-time region. So you can see this here on the left. And this party can do any intervention on the system received. So a party has a pass boundary. There's some input system coming from the outside. So you can think of a party as a laboratory as well. So there's some physical system entering the laboratory of the party. The party has some setting, uh, which is uh, depicted with this knob and uh, labeled by X, which is a classical setting. So you can you have your experiment, experiment and you, have, um, you can choose a setting in your apparatus. And then, with the experiment, the party observes some result, which is symbolized with this meter and labeled by A, which is again a classical variable. So the party does an experiment choosing, by choosing X and then sees some observation, which is A, and prepares a new system, which is then released to the future, a new physical system. So a party has an input, an output, some setting, and a result. And the setting and the result are always classical. These are random variables. The input and the output will depend on the underlying theory that we will use. So for example, we can think that we can think about the world where the, the, the systems that the parties receive are just classical random variables. So the input is a random variable, the output is a random variable. In this case, an intervention of a party is just a stochastic map from the setting of the party and the input to the measurement result and the output. But of course, we can also say, say that the input is a quantum system or even more general uh, systems. So if you have this notion of a party, then we can define an event as a single experiment of a party, which is, which is a single intervention. And now causal order means that no party is influenced by future parties. So if you have Alice and Bob, now I use these red squares to denote kind of their laboratories. 
Um, if you have Alice and Bob, and Alice has some classical setting X, and she observes some result A, Bob has some setting Y and some result B, then in this setup, in this um, setup where Bob is in the future light cone of Alice, the possible correlations that they can observe must factorize as this. So here on the left-hand side, we have the, the, the correlation, their observation. So given that Alice chose setting X and Bob chose setting Y, Alice observes A and Bob observes B, this observation must be decomposable in this way, where we see that the result of Alice depends only on her setting. It, it cannot depend on Bob's setting. Why? Why? Because there is no trajectory, there's no path from Bob to Alice but there is a path from Alice to Bob. So in the most general case, Bob can depend on, not only on his setting, but also on the setting of Alice and on the result of Alice, because Bob can receive all signals from Alice. And note now that here, if we, if we talk about causal order in the, on this level, just on the level of observations, and we say no party can, uh, no part is influenced by future parties, then we are agnostic about the underlying theory. So here we do not talk about what are the systems that are being exchanged between Alice and Bob. Um, so in other words, I do not need to talk about the input and the output, whether these are quantum states, uh, random variables, bits, this can be anything, but they must decompose in this way to be causal. So this definition, uh, this observation, led uh, Ognen Oreshko, Fabio Costa, and Joseph Bruckner in this paper from 2012 to define two-party causal correlations. So two-party correlations here, P, A, B, given X, Y, where again, X is the setting of Alice, A is the result of Alice, Y is the setting of Bob, P is the result of Bob. Two-party correlations are causal if and only if we can decompose them in this way, which means that with some probability lambda, Alice is before Bob. So Alice's result does not depend on Bob at all. And with probability one minus lambda, Bob is before Alice. So Bob's result does not depend on Alice. So if, if you take this definition for causal correlations, then we see that two-party causal correlations are at most one-way signaling. So the only, can, the only um, observations Alice and Bob can do if they share causal correlations are that Alice and Bob do not communicate at all, or Alice communicates to Bob, or Bob communicates to Alice. But never Alice communicates to Bob and Bob communicates to Alice. This would not be a causal correlation. I mean, there's a clarification question. Um, yes, uh, I, I struggle to see the questions on, I just see the, ah, here on top, okay. Uh, just a second. Um, I could just say the question. So Amin is asking, since A depends on X, is it sufficient to say that B depends on X and Y only? Since A depends on X, B on X and Y only? Well, you can think that A, um, you can, yes, kind of, because you can say that Bob can compute A from X. And this, yes, this is fine. Now I try to keep this chat window open so I can see. Okay. So by going to more than two parties, things get a little bit more complex, but not very much because of relativity. So let's consider an example of the three parties. We have Alice, Bob and Charlie. Now in relativity, Alice can influence everything within her future light cone, which is this top uh, cone. And since Bob and Charlie are inside this cone, Alice can actually choose the ordering of Bob and Charlie. She can place them wherever she wants. And this can actually be done in, in, in the relativity. So this makes the definition for multi-party causal correlations a little bit 
more complex, but not too much. So just to be general, we can say n party correlations, so correlations among n parties. So a1 to a n given x1 to xn, where a1 is the result of party one and x1 is the setting of party one and so on. These correlations are causal if and only if we can decompose them in this, in this way, where lambda k is a probability that says that with probability k, party k is before everyone else. So the observation, the result of party k depends only on her or his setting, but not on any other variables. And then the remaining, remaining term, which of course we still have to write down, put here, must be n minus one part, uh, n minus one party causal. So this is a recursive definition, which exactly reflects this fact that Alice can choose the ordering of Bob and Charlie. So having these definitions, this, the set of causal correlations forms a polytope. So we have a region which uh, inside this region and on the boundaries these are all causal correlations and the boundaries are just inequalities or hyperplanes. And just to clarify, if there are correlations that are not causal, we call them non-causal. It's just the term that we use to denote that the correlations are outside of this polytope, or in other words, they don't satisfy this definition. So now, why should we at all think about relaxing the notion of causal order? Or why should we even consider this space outside um, it seems very reasonable to have all this, like these standard definitions, like from, from physics or, or with in causal modeling. Well, one thing which is surely bad if we consider relaxation of the notion of causality or causal order is the grandfather paradox, which you might have heard already. It's, it's becoming, it's quite popular. It says that if a person travels to the past and kills uh, his or her grand grandfather, which is not a very nice story, and I apologize for this, then of course this person will not be born and thus cannot travel back to the past and thus cannot kill the grandfather. So we have a logical consistency, inconsistency here. And this we can model easily within this notion of parties. Namely, let's say we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and Alice outputs a system, which is a, just, let's say, a classical bit that travels to Bob. So the output of Alice is forwarded to the input of Bob. Bob negates this bit and sends it back to Alice. So here I would just draw this like this to make the diagram a bit simpler. So we have a connection, a signaling channel, identity signaling channel from Alice to Bob, and an identity signaling channel from Bob to Alice. Now, if Alice, just forwards the system that she receives. So she sets, her experiment is the following. She sets the output to be equal to the input. She just forwards whatever she receives. And Bob negates whatever he receives. So Bob's output is the negated bit of his input. Then of course, we reach a contradiction. We can just plug in this equation here on the, on the, on the lower one and we see we have a contradiction, zero equal one. So, this is surely bad, so maybe it's not a good idea to relax the notion of causal order, but we will see that it's not always that dramatic. Another problem with these uh, relaxations of causal order is the following, where we just change now the operation of Bob, the intervention of Bob. We now just say Bob forwards his system as well, just like Alice. Then, of course, this is completely consistent. We can take the first equation and put it in the second and we will find the solution. But actually now we don't know which, what the, the value of the system is, which state the system is in that travels between Alice and Bob. If these are bits, it can be zero or one. And the theory that has this property would be quite poor in predicting physical processes because we'll have multiple solutions and we don't know which one to pick. But this just, just to show you two problematic cases that occur when we kind of drastically uh, relax the notion of causal order. 
Good. So this is now this part. I have told you about causal order. I would come to the intermezzo on closed time like curves and I uh, check again for questions. No, I don't see any, but please feel free. I don't want to lose you on this, uh, on this talk. Um, yeah, so let's go to closed time like curves. So as I described before, closed time like curves are word lines or trajectories of a particle. And this trajectory, the particle never on this trajectory never travels faster than the speed of light, but still it, it goes around in space time and bumps with its younger self. So it's kind of a, uh, a locally speaking time, time traveling particle. And Einstein predicted the existence of such curves in general relativity in 1940. That was already before um, it was known, no, excuse me, before general relativity was fully developed. And in 24, then Langchos here on the top left, Cornelius Langchos, he, he showed the first solution to the Einstein equations that contain such closed time like curves. Um, later, they were proved to be self consistent, main, mainly by Kip Thorne, who got the Nobel Prize uh, some years ago. However, they have some problem, the billiard ball crisis that I will just uh, describe in a second. And all of this development had led Hawking in 91 to formulate the so-called chronology, chronology protection conjecture, which says that we will never be able to construct the scenario where we have closed time like curves. But this is a conjecture. So just uh, on closed time like curves, to, to, I'd like to explain you what, what these are. So here I take an example of a closed time like curve from a paper by Kip Thorne and, and collaborators. This is this, uh, with Friedman from the 1990 paper. And this is a space-time diagram, like you have seen before. So we have the time axis on the going from bottom to top, and we have the space axis on the horizontal. And these dotted lines going from bottom to top, these are word lines of two particles, you can say. So one particle is stationary, it does not move. And the numbers denote their proper time. So th these particles carry a clock. And here, this left particle shows 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. The right particle, on the other hand, is accelerated to some velocity and brought back to its initial position and to a stationary, uh, not, not to, yeah, to, to not move with respect to the left one anymore. And by this, this is just uh, what happens here is just simple time dilation. that. Uh, that one that appears if you accelerate the system to some high velocity and bring it back. And by this time dilation, the clocking change. You know? So the right, the right particle, the clock of the right particle shows zero here, one here, two here, three here, four here, and so on. So you see we have a desynchronization happening in the future of this S uh, surface. Okay. Now imagine that these are not part, simple particles that we that move along these word lines, but these are actually entrances to a wormhole. So general relativity is consistent with wormholes as well. And this wormhole is such that if you place a particle or an object on the left wormhole at some time, proper time, let's say one as an example, then it will exit the right entrance at time one and vice versa. So you can also go the other way around. You can take an object, put it somewhere on the right wormhole, and it will exit on the left at the same proper time. So by doing this time dilation with wormholes now instead of single particles, we see that we have closed time like curves in the future of S. One example is that a particle could travel along regular space time from point three on the left to point three on the right, enter the wormhole and therefore exit point three on the left again. And so it will loop around. So this is a, a word line of a, a trajectory of a particle and this trajectory will never exceed the speed of light, but it will kind of travel back to the past or it can bump with, uh, with itself, it collide with its younger version. And in the nineties, uh, beginning of the 90s, people were interested in these solutions and they asked 
well, they thought that having such a, a solution of the Einstein equation, such trajectories, such dynamics, this would lead to inconsistencies in the similar spirit as the grandfather paradox that I have uh, described to you before. So to resolve that or to attack this question, Novikov here on the picture together with Kip Thorne, Novikov is, is here on the right, um, defined the self-consistency principle, which says that any dynamics that can occur is only the dynamics that is consistent, which is kind of a trivial statement, but it is non-trivial if we consider also the, uh, the extra part without altering physics. So what do I mean? I mean that here at the surface P, which is in the past of the existence of any closed timeline curves, um, an experimenter can prepare a physical system in any state uh, as she or he wants. For instance, uh, we can prepare a billiard ball and shoot it in some direction with some velocity and some acceleration. Now, the question is, can we prepare a billiard ball? And this is actually what they calculated. Can we prepare a billiard ball to self-collide? So to go from time three on the left to time three on the right, enter the wormhole and exit at time three on the left again, such that it collides with itself and the collision will kick the younger version, so the, the, the billiard ball coming, of course, so that it will not travel to point three and back again which will be an inconsistency. Is, is this uh, question clear that they were asking? So what, what, what happened was actually quite surprising. The result is quite surprising that they found that in such situations, you don't have um, initial conditions which lead to inconsistencies. So to no consistent trajectory, to zero consistent trajectory. But these initial conditions where a ball interacts with its younger version have infinitely many consistent solutions. So here are three, just three depict. This is not space time, but just a spatial diagram with two space axes, y and x. And these black dots represent the, uh, the entrances to the wormhole. So a ball, a billiard ball comes from the bottom, collides with another one, enters the wormhole, exits on the left side, but in the past, so it's uh, back in time, and collides with its own version. This is one solution, or it could collide with itself, travel two times through along this loop and exit, or travel three times along the loop and exit, and so on. So they found an infinity of solutions, which says there is, they didn't find any initial condition where you have uh, grandfather antinomy. And based on this, then Hawking formulated, as I said before, the chronology protection conjecture, which says that we cannot, in physics, we cannot construct this situation, this, these loops. But so he, his conjecture, of course, is uh, not out of the blue. He analyzed some uh, solutions to the Einstein equations with closed time like curves. And found that some of them have uh, peculiar features, like they need uh, exotic uh, matter with uh, negative uh, energy density, but not all of them. So there are also some which are much more natural. But of course, one problem to, to address this question is that we don't have um, access to some regions in nature, like black holes, or they're very small, which is sometimes called quantum form. And also we don't have a theory which people agree on of quantum gravity to study this property. So the question is, can we find any other arguments to kind of rule out or to prove this conjecture? And the idea is kind of to, to go along the lines of conservative causality. So this brings me now to the main part. So this was kind of, uh, I just gave you the introduction of what I mean with conservative causality. I gave you a definition of causal order. And we discussed closed time like curves and the relation to that. Now we'll come to the main part and I see I'm already 38 minutes in. Hmm? That's correct, Gibran. Yes. Gibran? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, good. So let's look at a concrete example of, of a theory of conservative causality. And this concrete example is called the process matrix framework developed in 2012 by Ognia Noreshkov, Fabio Costa, and Chazaf Bruckner. And the main assumptions are these three ones. 
Every party performs a single quantum experiment of her choice. So here we assume that locally uh, quantum theory is, is valid. So that's why quantum experiment. Parties are isolated. So they cannot talk to each other directly. This will only arise through global dynamics. And locally, no party can observe any deviation from quantum theory. So this is kind of in this line of conser conservative causality that I have explained at the beginning. So assumption one, every party performs a single experiment means that every party K is described by a quantum instrument. So uh, these are quantum parties. They receive quantum systems. They choose some setting, observe some classical output and release some quantum systems. So this is just a quantum channel from, I, from the Hilbert space IK to the Hilbert space OK such that if we sum over all the possible observations, we will get a completely positive trace preserving map from the Hilbert space IK to the Hilbert space OK. So uh, a party is just a quantum instrument, which is another word for a quantum channel with classical input and classical output. Parties are isolated. So this assumption translates in the following way. Well, these descriptions of the parties or their interventions we just take the, uh, the collection of all of them for n parties. So they don't cross talk here directly. And locally, we don't observe any deviation from quantum theory is the fact that their observations are linear in the choice of operation. So if, if I do an experiment and I have, I can choose between two experiments, quantum experiments, I do this or that. Now I see some, I get some observation if I do the former, I see some observation if I do the latter. Now, if I do a convex combination of these two, I will also see a convex combination of the results as predicted by quantum theory. So this is kind of, we require therefore that their observations are linear in the choice of every party's intervention. So this then translates all together that for every choice of intervention, so every party must be able to do whatever the party wants to do, whatever experiment, quantum experiment the party wants to do. For every choice of uh, intervention, there exists observations such that we can take this function omega, apply it to the intervention and obtain the observations. Or in other words, the observations of the parties are a function of their interventions, are a function of their uh, experiments of the experiments, what they do. We don't talk about what are the input states, what are the output states. We just say their observations are a function, a multilinear function of the choice of experiment. So having this, it's uh, mathematics gets greatly simplified if you go to uh, the Joy Jamiokovsky picture, which uh, helps us to represent quantum channels or these quantum instruments as linear operators on the tensor product Hilbert space. And if we do this, we will observe that this, the global dynamics, which is given by this omega, is given now by some pro matrix W, which is also a linear operator on the tensor product of all Hilbert spaces involved. And the observations are just given by this simply simple trace formula, where W is this, uh, the process, the global dynamics, and this M, capital MK are the quantum instruments in this joy picture as linear operators. And the observation is just a trace of these two. And uh, this is uh, actually quite, uh, it's kind of a generalization of, 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 of quantum measurements, if you so want. And this gives, in, gives us now the definition of a process matrix. Um, w is a process matrix, if and only if for all quantum instruments, this expression is a probability distribution. It's nothing more than that. So now just look at some, let's look at some uh, simple examples. So what we see is now the process matrix is a resource that establishes the communication or correlations among the parties. And kind of it's a unifying picture for states and channels. So here we have Alice and Bob, then a process matrix W can be such that it provides input states to Alice and Bob and ignores the corresponding output states. So this is just a shared state. And if you would do the math, you would see that this will just have this form. W is just rho, which is a density operator on Alice and Bob, tensor identity on the output spaces. But we could also have a communication channel. So where Alice obtains some quantum system and she does the experiment and the, the output system from Alice is forwarded to Bob. And the output of Bob is ignored. 
This is then given by such a matrix, such a process matrix. We have a density operator for Alice. This is the identity channel. So this is basically nothing else. It's just a notation if you have seen it. If you haven't, it just means it's just the maximally entangled state, unnormalized, which is the identity channel in the toy picture <clears throat> and connects the output of Alice with the input of Bob. And then we ignore Bob's output. But this here, that's why I crossed this W, cancel this W, is not a process matrix. So if you look at this expression here, it would represent the identity channel from Alice to Bob and from Bob to Alice. And this is kind of the grandfather paradox that we have seen at the beginning of these talks. And well, it's not a process matrix. What does it mean? There exists some channels, completely positive trace preserving maps for Alice and Bob, such that this trace expression is zero or more precisely is not one, but actually you can bring it down to zero, which says, but since these are completely positive trace preserving maps and the probabilities must always sum to one, we have a contradiction here. They don't sum to one and this canceled W is not a process matrix. But so until now, we didn't see anything interesting we can do with process matrices, but here is the first uh, thing, which was at the beginning discovered by Golnagi in 2012, before, before actually the framework was developed. Uh, and later on, uh, it appeared in the papers of uh, Ognian, Fabio, and Chaslav and, and, and others. And this is now where you see that there's some connection to general relativity, namely through the quantum switch. So what is the quantum switch? Well, let's look at the right picture first. And this round, big round, big circle denotes a position of the mass. It can be on the left side. So we look at the filled uh, circles or it's on the right so we look at the non-filled circles if it is on the right on the left then here we have again trajectories of two particles with their corresponding clocks if it is on the left then the particle which is closer to that object the, the clock uh, ticks slower this is kind of the slogan lower is slower so here we have time zero time one time two time three on the right the right particle which is farther away than the left one, the clock is faster, zero, one, two, three. If you put the mass to the right position, it's just the opposite. So we have zero, one, two, three for the right particle, and zero, one, two, three for the left particle. And here you see that if we place now the object on the left again, that point three on the right is in the past of point three in the left. So there's a signal that can travel from here to here. If we put it on the right, on the other hand, we have a signal that goes from point three on the left to point three on the right. So depending on where we put the mass, we can say that Alice can communicate to Bob at time three, or Bob can communicate to Alice at time three. But now in a quantum gravity idea, one could say, well, this massive object is placed in a superposition of being left and right. And then we would have kind of a superposition or an, an entangled causal structure. And this can be expressed very neatly in the process matrix framework. So here, instead of having just two parties, we'll also have a global past and a particle of F for future. So now, depending on the state preparation of at P, the particle, let's say uh, there's a control system that P can prepare. If the, the control system is zero, which is kind of the first line of this expression down here, then the particle goes along the solid line. So first to Alice and then to Bob and then to F, so Alice can communicate to Bob. If, on the other hand, this control system is in the state one, it goes first, it goes along the dashed line, which means first to Bob, then to Alice, and then to the future. And this now allows one to generate this kind of entangled causal order, or sometimes called superposition of causal order. Good. So this was the quantum case, but now let's briefly just look at the classical version of it, which I find personally much simpler because we don't have to talk about quantum theory anymore and still we will find interesting um, consequences and the results. So here are the assumptions to build kind of the theory of conservative causality of, of discrete functions. The assumptions are that every party performs a function of her choice, some intervention, but it's a function. Again, parties are isolated and locally we don't observe any contradiction. <laughs> which is uh, just plain. So here, 
The input and output spaces are just discrete sets. So if we look at the party again, this is the input space, this is a discrete set, the output space is a discrete set. And the party is now described just by a function. It takes some element from this discrete set, let's say a, a bit string, and has some setting x and outputs another element in the discrete set and some observation. Now, if you just follow, take this assumption and apply the same kind of ideas, reasonings as before for the quantum case, we will end up actually in a quite nice characterization of what global dynamics now is possible in such a theory. And these global dynamics, we describe them by uh, an object called process function. We use a little omega symbol for, for, for this object. And process functions are just functions they describe the global dynamics, but they are functions from the output spaces of the parties, let's say from Alice and Bob. So they take the systems from the output spaces and is a function and provide new, provide input spaces to Alice and Bob. So from OK to IK, such that for every choice of intervention that Alice and Bob do, so they can perform any choice of uh, any function of their choice, for any choice, if we concatenate these two functions, so the one by Alice, the one by Bob, together with Omega, there exists a fixed point. There exists, in other words, one, uh, at least one consistent solution. It's just, uh, I think this, this makes it quite, uh, quite simple to deal with this, with this uh, framework for classical conservative causality. And now we can see that we can do inter interesting things with this. Namely, we can go beyond this notion of causal order that I have explained you in the beginning. And for this, we look at, at the game, which uh, is kind of the standard approach to, to these uh, questions. And this is a three-party game by, uh, where Alice, Bob, and Charlie are involved. And they all have a binary setting and a binary result. So all the spaces are binary. And now we re request that the, the results must satisfy these equations. So Alice's result must be the negation of Bob's setting and logical and uh, Charlie's setting and so on. Now one can show, which is a quite fairly simple proof, that the maximum winning probability for this game, if they are restricted to have causal correlations, is three quarter. But on the other hand, there exists a process function, omega, such that if they use this process function, they can win this game with probability one. So this shows that we can have cyclic causal structures where no inconsistency arises, no matter what they do locally. So actually this will be something of this form. Alice will be in the past of Bob and Charlie, Charlie in the past of Alice and Bob, and Bob in the past of Alice and Charlie. So this is a cyclic causal structure. And, and here, just to, to, to note, there's a paper also from, uh, by Cyril Bronciard with a, with a nice collection of very simple such causal inequalities and their violations. So that's, so what does this mean now? So let me come now kind of to um, a series of properties or what, what have you learned until now if you look at these theories of conservative causality? What can we say about them? And one thing is, uh, is a recent result together with uh, Amin Shiraz Gilani and uh, Gibran Rashid, namely that we can find violations of causal inequalities for any number of parties and not only violations, but also deterministic violations. So here, if you look at this diagram, you will see this dark region is the polytope of causal correlations. So these are all correlations that satisfy this notion, this definition of causal, uh, causal order. So this means everything outside this dark region, are, these correlations are non-causal and the process functions give you uh, access to that, to these non-causal correlations up to deterministic violations. And the circle in which the whole, the bigger polytope is embedded is kind of the set of quantum um, non-causal correlations. So correlations that are attainable with process matrices. And with the student Lefteris, we also have shown uh, one year ago that actually if we follow this 
reasoning of, of parties and, and in this notion of conservative causality, there is no billiard ball crisis, uh, I have you told you before. <clears throat> There's no infinity of consistent solutions. There's only one. And actually, we have shown that if you have a theory where you have the grandfather paradox that I've described you before, then you also have the information paradox and vice versa. So these two problems are actually the same. And uh, there's a series of results that show some in enhanced information processing with the quantum switch. So there's some results on query complexity. There's some quadratic advantage over causal quantum protocols for channel discrimination. There's also some possibly exponential advantage in communication complexity by using the quantum switch. And there's some interesting results where one can communicate uh, through channel with zero information capacity, which seems extremely counterintuitive. And also some results on inverting unitary operations by the use of, of uh, the quantum switch and indefinite causal structures. And we also have some more um, results on, on, on complexity theories about this uh, conservative causality. So kind of the process functions of the classical case, we cannot solve NP-hard problems efficiently with this model. And in the quantum case with process matrices, we cannot solve PP-hard problems efficiently. However, kind of this later result uh, together that we developed together with Matteo Sarujo and uh, Philippe Alaguerin is believed to be quite loose. It just follows from the post-selected closed timeline curves model, if you are familiar with that. And uh, yes, note that the other models of closed timeline curves are actually quite strong computationally. So this shows us a huge decrease in the computational power of, of this uh, conservative causality. Moreover, we can show that we can always make the dynamics linear and reversible and without ruling out any of the other features that I've discussed so far. And we can understand conservative dynamics and conservative causality as closed timeline curves. There was also a paper together with uh, Fabio, Costa, Tim Ralph, Stefan Wolf, and Magdalena Zich on this topic. Um, so where we have closed timeline curves that are tame in, in, in a broad sense. So we don't have insane computational power. We have reversibility and we don't have this bigger ball crisis appearing. So these are all kind of these properties that I've just talked told you one by one. Here's a huge list of, uh, of references uh, showing these, these, these properties. But so we kind of fall back a bit to the main questions that we started with because um, because I was just distracted by these questions. Thank you, Amin, for, for the question. So Amin asks, can we solve NP-hard problems efficiently using process matrices? You mean the, oh, sorry, you mean quantum process matrices? And the answer to this is unknown. This is the, we don't know. We don't know this, the answer to this question. It will be interesting to show not, but showing not would mean that we would show that BQP, the set of uh, efficient quantum computing, uh, the problems that we can efficiently solve with quantum computers is contained in NP, which is a big open question. I hope this, this helps. Uh... So having said all this, we see that, well, we have a model uh, or a, a family of theories, a comprehensive model, conservative causality, where we can embed many theories, any theory T of, of your choice. And so far, the observations are that the properties of these theories are extremely tame, or they don't seem to change much. So in the complexity setting, we don't know too much, actually, where we have some results that show, that indicate that they are not too strong computationally. So it seems that these theories of conservative causality are very natural in, in the sense of the theory that we embed, like very close to quantum theory, very close to probability theory and so on. With the only kind of unnatural part of it is the violation of causal order. So we have a, a, the, a set, a family of theories where the thing that is missing with respect to the traditional theories that we use is the notion of causal order. So 
I kind of advocate that this, therefore, this notion of conservative causality captures kind of the notion of causal order because it's the only thing that is missing. And this allows us now to kind of ask within this framework, uh, what assumptions, what additional assumption do we need such that we can derive causal order? And then we could use this to kind of find the origin, kind of a logical, uh, logical prior to causal order, and maybe to make statements about closed timeline curves, which is kind of the second main question that I have uh, on this slide. Kind of, can we approach the question whether closed timeline curves are mathematical artifacts or general relativity or not with, the, with this, uh, by finding an assumption from which causal order follows? Of course, I have said that before that closed timeline curves are usually uh, doomed uh, unnatural because, of course, we don't have any observations of them. The space time geometries also don't seem very natural. But these are all just case by case studies, more or less. So the goal would be to have a more information theoretic solid argument against closed timeline curves if that is possible. So far, we don't have any. And what well, this is closely related to this th uh, third question here, are there any severe consequences of violation of causal order? Severe, like uh, uh, extravagant computational power would be an example, but we, we don't have that, but there could also be severe consequences like uh, that we could do bit commitment or obvious transfer, some cri cryptographic primitives that are otherwise, uh, that otherwise seem to be impossible to establish in nature. And of course, then we can go on and ask about future theories that we don't have developed yet or we have developed many of them, like quantum gravity, and we don't know which one to pick. Can we make statements about those by using this framework? So with this, I, ah, there's another, Victoria, thank you for the question. Do you know if string theory is a conservative causal theory or is it a property added to it? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar at all with string theory, so I'm, I'm afraid I cannot really answer uh, this question. So I don't think it's, a, no, uh, well, uh, it's not a conservative causality theory in the sense that I have described here because it's, it's not operational theory. We don't talk about Alice and Bob and you don't assume that some theory is, is, is true locally. So I hope this, uh, answers the question and yeah with this i'm really sharp on time one minute over but i thank you a lot for your attention i really hope you you, you could take something with you